Good evening, Crossroads. Happy Wednesday. How are we feeling tonight? Y'all just can't stop talking about candy, can you? You just can't, you can't help yourself. Uh, all right. For me, it's the, not the Milky Way, that's not good enough. I need the midnight Milky Way. I need the dark chocolate. Mil Anybody with me on that midnight Milky Way? Yeah, come on, come on, let's go. If you didn't like that answer, I know a lot of you will not like the next answer because next to the midnight Milky Way for me is not Red Vines, but Twizzlers. Let's go! I've been told there's like seven people in the world that love Twizzlers and I'm one of them, but apparently they all go to Crossroads, so hallelujah. I knew this place was great. Uh, hey, welcome to Wednesday night. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're in a series uh, where we are going through spiritual disciplines. And so for those of you that are in the building, out on the patio, or maybe you're joining us online, uh, last week, Pastor Chuck kicked us off as we've been going through this journal. And uh, this week, uh, we're going through, uh, we're going to go through section two, to, uh, through chapter two, and we're talking about discipleship and the disciplines and what that looks like. In your journal this week, you're going to see what it looks like uh, that discipleship embraces. It's this, like, it's this lordship that we, that we surrender ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Then we become like him and then we love him and love others. Tonight we're gonna look at what are some of those disciplines? What are some of the things that would be true of a disciple? Uh, this coach uh, was filling up his varsity high school basketball roster and uh, they had a pretty good team. And there were two spots, or there was one spot left, and there were two guys that he was choosing between. One of the guys uh, was a six foot seven sophomore, uh, and uh, that would be him right there. And uh, the other one would actually be a five foot ten sophomore. No sophomore had ever made the varsity team at this high school before, ever. No, nobody. So they were going back and forth, and you had a six foot seven sophomore, and then you had a five foot ten sophomore. So the coach was really trying to do his best to figure out who to keep, and he would keep the seven, a six foot seven sophomore to fill out the final roster spot on the varsity team at Laney High School in Wilmington, North Carolina. And the other sophomore, the five foot ten sophomore, would be cut from the varsity team, and he would be offered a spot on the junior varsity team. A real hit to his ego. But this fueled him, and this drove him, and this actually inspired him to become a bigger and better player. In fact, that next year, he would grow about six inches, and the next year, he would make the varsity team alongside the guy, the six foot seven guy. By the way, you've never heard of the six foot seven guy. The six foot seven guy on the screen right now is Harvest Leroy Smith Jr. None of you have ever heard of him. And if you have, then you are a basketball nerd, and I love you for it. But the next guy would work really hard that next year. He would grow. And in his very first year as a junior, he would make the varsity team. And in his very first varsity game, he would go out and he would set a school record and score 35 points in his first ever varsity game. Standing next to him that next year in that photo right there, you're going to see on that screen, is a man that I know all of you have heard of. His name is Michael Jordan. Yeah. Now, yeah. how in the world did it get to this place where Michael Jordan would be cut from this team. And we've all, you, you've probably heard that story or some semblance of it, that he got cut from his team and he would be fueled and he would be driven. There would be something that would happen uh, that, that would happen in his life where Michael Jordan knew that if he was going to be something special, he needed to start doing things that set him apart from everybody else. Now, if we go and we look in our Bible, you could go and you could find incredible stories of amazing men and women who lived incredible lives of faith, and they set themselves apart from other people that you're gonna read about in scripture. You could read about stories today about people that commit themselves to Christ in such a way that they don't want to look like the world. They don't wanna look like any other person. Now, if you wanna look at a cheat sheet in your Bible, you could go to Hebrews chapter 11, and this uh, particular chapter in scripture is commonly referred to as the Hall of Faith. We know Michael Jordan, of course, is in the Hall of the National Basketball uh, Hall of Fame, the, the Professional Basketball Hall of Fame, um, and we know that many of these that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, we don't have time to go through them tonight, they lived their lives differently. 
And we go through and we see their incredible stories of faith that they would commit themselves to live set apart, to live differently than the world, to live even differently than people that followed God and surrendered themselves to Jesus. They would actually live their lives even differently. And it makes me wonder, how uh, would anybody get to that place? In fact, I want to pose that question. What did it take for those that we see in Hebrews chapter 11? What would it take somebody like a Michael Jordan? What would it take for them to practice their craft in such a way that they would be able to set themselves apart? Now, if we remove the basketball analogy for a second and we look at people's lives that they live committed to Christ... What did it take for them to get to that place? As we see in Hebrews chapter 11, it would be this. They chose to live their lives differently than everyone else. They chose and they made a commitment. It didn't just happen. Michael Jordan didn't just happen to make the varsity team next year. Did he grow six inches? Yeah. Did that help? Of course. But as you know, height is not everything. You see some very tall people out in the world today and they don't, they've never touched a basketball before. It takes this hard work, it takes this commitment, it takes this idea that if we want to commit ourselves to something and be excellent at it, we have to look differently than everybody else. And when it comes to our walk with the Lord, the same is true. It doesn't change. If we want to look more like God, we have to stop looking like everything else because nothing else in this world actually resembles Jesus. Only Jesus resembles himself. And we want to be like him, then we have to model our lives and our behaviors and our commitments after him and nothing else. And if that sounds radical and almost like, wow, that seems, that seems very, uh, seems crazy, it's because it is. You could fit in and you could look like the world and any particular, uh, any particular way, and yet it wouldn't look anything like Christ. Choosing to be a disciple of Jesus requires the same kind of commitment. Jesus makes it exceedingly clear in Scripture for us. The great part is Jesus doesn't hide the ball. It's not like there's some uh, Morse code that we have to go into Scripture and kind of figure out. Jesus actually makes it super clear that if we want to be his disciple, if we want to choose to commit our lives to him, if we want to follow him, he makes it crystal clear. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. That part right there, you must give up your own way. That right there is the hang up for everybody. But we all like our own way. If you're like me, I find that I think that my way is almost always the best way. And I'm a fool for, some of you are like, like, oh, this this guy's already a clown. But I think that my way is the best way. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear If you want to be my follower, if you want to run after me, you must give up your own way. In the uh, NASB, in the New American Standard, it says this. I'm going to read this translation. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we must deny ourselves We must be willing to give up our own way. This is the blueprint. This is what we are to do, that if we want to be set apart, if we want to look different than the world, if we want to embrace the disciplines and we want to be considered a committed follower of Christ, very simply right there, we got to give up our own way. We have to be willing to deny ourselves the things that we want and we must run after the things that Jesus wants for us. Now, Jesus' purpose was a little bit different than ours. Jesus' purpose would actually be marked very clearly in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where it says this, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the first part, that actually pertains to us a little bit, that we would come and we would serve other people, if we're going to embrace the likeness of Jesus, if we're going to desire to be like him, then we must be willing to serve others. We must be willing to be a servant to all. Now, that last part, we can't do that. Where it says, and he came and he gave his life as a ransom for many. This would be Jesus' purpose. 
This will be what Jesus would go and do on our behalf. Our purpose is to deny, deny ourselves. Our purpose is to give up our own way. If we choose to embrace this, then we are making a commitment to be like Christ more than we desire to be like ourselves. And is it perfect? No, it'll never be perfect. It'll never be perfect. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In Matthew 10, 24 and 25, it says, Students are not greater than their teacher and slaves not greater than their master. Students are to be like their teacher and slaves are to be like their master. Now, we see this idea that if this likeness, if this is what we are going to embrace, if we want to be set apart, if we want to be different, if we want to live a lifestyle that is different than that of the world, there has to be some things that are true of us. There has to be some characteristics that we're willing to run after. And there's three things that I want to highlight tonight. Because born out of this commitment to Christ, that if we're willing to say yes, if we're willing to say, Jesus, I'm all in, I'm ready to go, it's going to require a lot. It's going to require a huge sacrifice. Namely this, that we're willing to not do it our way, but we're willing to do it God's way. Which is already exceedingly difficult. What we actually come face to face with is this idea that we're willing to embrace heart transformation. That we're allowing God to actually come and transform us. And the incredible part about it is, if our hearts are in it, then it will begin to happen. And there's things that will begin to happen. We're gonna dive into that. But there's something opposite of this heart transformation and it's, it's, it's what we would call behavior modification. How many of you are parents in here? You do not have to look any further about great examples of behavior modification than raising your own children, right? You guys hang out, maybe you hang out with your niece and nephew, maybe you hang out with your grandparents, or your, uh, your grandkids, your grandparents, yeah, behavior modification, never mind. But you don't have to look any further than being around children to know that sometimes they're not into quite yet this idea of heart transformation. Why? Because if they give you attitude or they give you lip, then they lose their screen time or they lose dessert or they lose hanging out with their friend or they lose their cell phone and they will change their behavior. They're interested in changing their behavior. They will modify their behavior because they fear the punishment. Oftentimes this is how we embrace our relationship with the Lord we fear the punishment, and yet we're missing this whole idea that there's a heart transformation on the other side. Obedience that is born out of obligation is not transformation. Obedience born out of obligation is not transformation. And so here's where we're at. We have this, do we, do, do we want to be all in? Or am I just making some decisions because I'm afraid that I might tick off the big guy upstairs and I don't want to be in trouble with him? Or is it this authentic relationship where we're not afraid to make mistakes? Not that we would willingly go and do something foolish or dumb, though those things can sometimes happen. But are we willing to cast aside our own desires and run after God, knowing that it won't be perfect, but knowing that we wish for our hearts to be transformed? There must be three characteristics that would be true of somebody that would call themselves a disciple, and we're gonna dive into that tonight. And by the way, we see this beautifully wrapped up in a chapter, John chapter 15. There's incredible, incredible imagery of what it looks like for somebody to be a disciple, of what it looks like for the disciplines that would be true of somebody who's committed their lives to Christ, someone who wants to run after Jesus, someone who wants to deny themselves and run after what Jesus has. Three characteristics. Number one, we're going to pull these all out of John chapter 15. Number one, we, uh, if you're going to be a disciple, we must abide in God's word. That must be the most important thing in our life. This becomes our ultimate authority. This must be our ultimate authority. John chapter 15, verses five through seven, it says this. These are Jesus' words. He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. You ready for it? But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want and it will be granted. 
You see, we must be a people that abide in God's word. We must sit in and remain in God's word. The hard part is there's a lot of things that we read about in scripture that we don't like. There's a lot of things that we will go and we'll read and like, I don't really like that. And what we're doing is, is we are not denying ourselves any longer. We are actually feeding ourselves with our own food instead of going to scripture, which will actually nourish you, that will actually fill you. Because we don't like what it says. It's harsh. But I like this thing that I've been partaking in. But I like this, I like to treat this person this way. Or I like whatever it might be. It all drills down to the fact that we're unwilling to deny ourselves and instead we actually allow ourselves. You see the mark of a disciple is one who abides, who stays in God's word and sticks to it no matter what. No matter how harsh it is. Now here's the beautiful part about this whole passage right here in John chapter 15. We see that branches get cut no matter what. Branches will get cut. We call it pruning. We prune things back so that they can actually grow better. Right? We don't just let it keep growing and growing and growing. We actually prune it back so it actually can come back stronger. That's called pruning, but we're aware that as we read in John chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, we actually see that there's going to be branches that will be cut up and thrown into the fire because it produces no fruit. There's no desire in those branches to actually deny yourself. And I think we have to come to grips with the fact that am I choosing to deny myself? Am I choosing to adhere to what scripture says even when I hate what it says? It's hard. It's difficult. Denying yourself was always meant to be difficult. If this was easy, everybody would do it. Everybody would be like, oh yeah, I'll be a Christian. And then guess what would happen? Nobody would do it because it's too easy. Nobody does it because it's too easy. It's hard. It's difficult. And we have to deny ourselves. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, it says this, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, the word of God is actually designed to be like a mirror. Oftentimes, especially in our world today and in the nature of what our world might experience in the next, oh, I'm just going to pick a random number of weeks, I don't know, three weeks, the next three weeks in, this, in, our, in our world, in our, in our nation, sometimes we look at the Bible and we wish it was like a hammer. That's what we wish it was. But the Bible's actually a mirror. And I'm going to invite Trey out for a second. Trey's going to come help me with something. And um, I've got this mirror and there's two sides to this mirror right now. And the beautiful part about the mirror uh, right here is um, this, uh, I, I, I like this phrase right now, and I bet some of you might agree with this, right? Good from far, right? Oh yeah, that's good, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got, I got a haircut last week. Um, I always kind of sweat up here a little bit. Honestly, wearing a sweatshirt tonight, bad idea. I'm kind of sweating a little bit. Um, you can't see that right now because it's far away, but the Bible, the more that we sort of keep it at a distance like this, the more that we realize, oh, you know what? It's actually not that bad. It's not that offensive. It doesn't look that ugly. It's not actually exposing the ugliness of my life because this is what happens when we choose to ignore the hard things. When we choose to not obey or abide in God's word, we look at the word of God and we're like, hey, that's not too bad, actually. This is pretty good. I mean, maybe I should have cleaned this up a little bit. I got a little lazy, you know, so whatever. It's one of those days. It's good. But here's the problem. If we really commit ourselves, this is what happens when we choose to deny ourselves. We flip this thing and we get an up-close view. We get an up-close view of this thing. And let me tell you, the up-close view is hideous. Look at those grays, guys. Look at those. Look at, look at that. I didn't wear my retainer. You seeing that? Trey, you getting that right there? Is that good? How are we, how are we looking, Trey? Is that good? Yeah, dude. Look at that. It's great. I didn't wear my retainer on the bottom. You see, that was good. He's like, please don't make me do that ever again. When we actually allow, 
when we actually allow the word to actually get as close as it possibly can, when it abides, when we abide in it, when we run to it instead of run away from it, then all of a sudden what happens is, is we say, oh, good from far. And then you look up close and you're like, oh gosh, far from good. And that's what we look at sometimes. And we think about our lives and we feel good about ourselves. But if we actually slowed down and we actually began to deny ourselves, we would look and say, oh man, this mess is in need of a Messiah, no doubt. Because it looks good from far, but it is far from good. And this is oftentimes what we experience in our relationship with the Lord. Because there's things we'd much rather look at ourselves with the normal mirror, because this is just a whole lot easier. We, have, we don't have to come to grips with a whole lot looking like this. But the minute that we flip that and we get a closer look, all of a sudden we're like, oh man, I don't like what I see. And we're brought to this fork in the road, this, wait for it, crossroads. That's what we're waiting for. It's this, we're with this crossroads. It's, I feel like that joke just doesn't get used enough here. I feel, I feel like we should bring that back. That's good. But we're at this crossroads where am I willing to put in the hard work because I don't like what I see? Or do I think that the work is irredeemable? Do I think that the work cannot be helped? And that all comes down to our view of how much we truly trust Jesus to bring redemption to our lives. Because the truth will set you free. Is it offensive? Yes. Does it hurt? Yes. Does it show that you forgot to wear your bottom braces? Yes. Full disclosure, guys, I'm not kidding you. I flossed before we came out and run through. I flossed because I knew I was going to be doing this. I flossed, okay? I got this thing up in my grill here, and there was still a piece of food in my teeth. (laughs) I couldn't see it from the good from far. You know how I saw it? The far from good side. And I knew that I had a little bit more work to do. So I went to my car and got a floss pick and it's gone. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah, I can floss. Very good. All the dentists in here rejoice. But we must abide in God's word no matter how harsh it feels, no matter how much truth we encounter because that is the mark of a disciple. There's a second thing that John brings out in John chapter 15. It's this. We must love other people. And I'm gonna go back to a window of time that I just randomly picked, uh, I don't know, three weeks. Uh, As Christians, our responsibility when the world, namely our country, is at a boiling point, that's when Christians must rise to the top. Not because we're boiling mad, but because we're willing to go out and be peacemakers. Because we're willing to go out and speak truth. Because we're willing to go out and say, it honestly doesn't matter which political candidate wins because Jesus is still on the throne and that's all that matters. It's all that matters. Jesus said this, John 15, 12 through 14. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. If you go throughout the New Testament and you begin to pull some things apart, you'll actually discover that there's anywhere from, some people will say 58, 59, 60, somewhere in that range of, they call them the one another's. And it's the responsibility that we have towards our brothers and sisters, towards the world that we live in, that we are held responsible for how we care for one another, how we love one another, how we look out for one another. And there's all kinds. You could go go Google 58 one another's and you'll find an exhaustive list listed in multiple different places but coming out to about 58 or 59 unique one another's in the New Testament. This is how much Jesus wants us to catch this. Because the mark of a disciple is one that truly loves one another. And let's, can we be honest for a second? There are some hard people to love. There are some hard people. 
And I know nobody in here is hard to love. I know that. There's nobody. Everybody in here is easy to love, right? There's nervous laughter because you know that I'm lying through my teeth right now. My crooked bottom teeth for that matter. There's hard people to love. But you know what? If we really began to look at ourselves, not on the good from far side, but the far from good side, we would actually begin to realize this truth about ourselves. I'm hard to love sometimes. I'm hard to love sometimes. My wife is um, brilliant. She's amazing. Uh, And I'll never forget, um, we were, it was COVID time and all that stuff and our kids were obviously in our home just like so many of you and our kids were probably like I don't know like third grade and kindergarten or something like that and uh, it was it was tough it was tough I think COVID ended up being an incredible blessing Uh, my one of my children um, I'm just going to say that is more like my wife and another one of my uh, one of our children is more like me the one that is not like me I don't understand quite as much. I don't understand quite as well. And um, I'll never forget, I was just so frustrated. And I remember telling my wife, and I was venting, and honestly, if I'm being honest, I was venting because I was looking for pity. And I remember saying to her, I said, man, it is so frustrating that I try to get my point across, and I'm trying to teach, and I'm trying to love, and I'm trying to redirect, and I'm trying to be patient, and every time that I feel like I'm there and that this child actually gets it, they don't. And I was like, I was was beyond myself, so frustrated. And my wife, who's brilliant, literally said this. She goes, it kind of makes you think how God views us and it made me really think about because I'm not difficult (laughs) that she must have been talking about hers I'm just kidding it made me realize that no matter how easy to love and to like and to be around that you are God is just as gracious with you as he is with the hardest person in your life to love And oftentimes we have a halo effect around how we think about ourselves. And in just the same way that we are called to go and love other people, God always reminds us, by the way, you want to know how you're able to go love other people? Because I loved you first. And we must always remember that his love that loved us first enables us to go and love other people. We have to remember that we are unlovable, that it is hard, that no matter how good we think we might be or easy to like and to love that we might be, we are still difficult. That's why the New Testament is filled with examples of, by the way, this is what you should do to one another. This is how you should love one another. This is how you should look out for one another, to lift, each, to lift one another's burdens up, to be patient with one another. We just finished a series going through the fruit of the Spirit. And we looked at, by the way, if you missed that series, go back, re-watch them. They're all amazing. You go back and you have an opportunity to see what happens when you allow the Spirit to actually work in your life. And there's things that we do and there's things that we say and the way that we live our lives, namely, we, we don't deny ourselves, that all of a sudden we find that we're quenching the Spirit. But the Spirit can unleash us to do great things. And it all started because Jesus loved us, which enabled us to fulfill his command to go and love other people. So we must abide in God's word. We see that in God's word, our command is to go love one another. And then it brings us to a third thing, that honestly, we can't skip the first two to try to get to the third one. And the third one is this, the third mark of a true disciple is someone who bears fruit. It's someone who bears fruit. John 15, 
1 through 4 and verse 8 says this, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. Remember we just talked about that. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. And if we abide by it, it continues to produce fruit in us. Verse 4, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. When we produce much fruit, we are considered his disciples. The first two things matter, but we have to be able to produce fruit. It's why this journal is so important. It's why this is a tool, an opportunity to be able to spend time with the Lord. The marks of a disciple and the different things that must be true of us, we're going to continue to unpack over this series. There's different things that we have to commit ourselves to. There's practices that we see that Jesus calls us to that we're going to continue to, 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 to put out. And it requires us to bear fruit. Now, we talked about Michael Jordan at the top. We talked about how he committed himself to a craft. We talked about how he committed himself and he wanted to be the best. He didn't want to be like everybody else. He wanted to separate himself. As believers, we're called to do the same thing. We're supposed to separate ourselves. And if we're separating ourselves, it's because we are doing things that look different than the world. And the rest of this series is going to help showcase the things that we can do that actually show that we bear fruit in our lives. But there's something that I don't want you to miss. The more that you practice something, the better that you become the better you become at it. The better you become at it. There was a game that happened with Michael Jordan. Many of you have probably seen this clip. Many of you have probably heard this story, but maybe you don't know the context of the clip. So the Bulls are playing the Denver Nuggets, and it's late in the game, and the game is all but over. There's a few seconds left. Michael Jordan gets fouled, and he goes to the free throw line. And there's a guy on the uh, Denver Nuggets uh, who just actually recently passed away. His name was Dikembe Mutombo. He was a center. He was known for his shot blocking ability. And Michael Jordan goes to the free throw line and he has this exchange with Dikembe Mutombo and it's up on the screen and I'm just gonna walk you through this. So the referee hands the ball uh, to Michael Jordan and he's at the free throw line. And when he's at the free throw line, Dikembe says something to him and he says, hey Mutombo, this one's for you, baby. He closes his eyes and swishes the free throw. <laughs> there are times where we have an opportunity to fall back on something that we have done time and time and time and time and time again that no matter when the enemy shows up, no matter when the enemy is running its mouth, no matter when the enemy comes at us, we have an opportunity to stand strong and say, you know what, I'm gonna fall back on the spiritual training, I'm gonna fall back on the spiritual muscle memory that I've committed myself to, because when hard things happen in my life, I don't run and freak out, my number one is I go to God first, and I talk to God about it first, because the enemy is gonna run his mouth and he's gonna try and deter you. Just in the same way that I don't know why Dikembe Mutombo decided that would be a great day to poke at Michael Jordan. Many of you have probably heard that. And if you've ever played basketball, if you've ever, if you've ever played horse, you know the shot. You're standing at the free throw line and you're like, eyes closed. And then you try to make it. And if you've made it, honestly, probably lucky. You think Michael Jordan making that free throw eyes closed was lucky? A hundred percent not. Why? Because he, he shot hundreds of thousands of free throws over and over and over again. What's the equivalent for a believer? It's that every single day we spend time with the Lord. Why? Because I want to hear his voice. Because I want to be present with him. 
that no matter when hard things hit, my number one is not to go into problem solve mode. My number one action is not to try and figure this out on my own. It's not to freak out. It's not to call somebody else. But my number one is to go to God first because I have so much spiritual muscle memory because I've committed myself to Christ first that when those hard times come, when you get the phone call that you never thought that you would get, when you got let go from your job, when you came home to your house and your stuff was all put out on the front step or your spouse had left you or you have a child, an adult child that's walked away from the Lord, that when you have that kind of moment happen, you don't have to freak out and melt down, but instead you get to stand tall and you get to say, enemy, you're not gonna have the best of me today because my spiritual muscle memory says that I go to God first. And that must be true of us. That must be true of us. Now, I brought out another journal. If you've been around Crossroads for a while, maybe you have this journal. Maybe you're, this is the old Revelation journal. How many of you guys have this? Who has this? Yeah. yeah. I think, you, can you still order it? I don't know. Is it on? Is it on? I don't know if it's on Amazon. Go order it. I don't know. It might be on. Chuck wrote this Revelation journal. Can we get like a, a close up of this? Right there. If you thought, oh man, this spiritual disciplines journal, this thing is brutal. Look how many pages this is. That's nothing compared to the Revelation journal, y'all. That's good stuff right here. That's good stuff. As I was thinking about this message, as I was thinking about what it means to deny yourself, you know what's not true of me? And you know what's not true of this journal? This thing's not complete. There's days that I missed. Is that okay? <laughs> no? It's a trick. It's a trick question. Look, I got days in here that I missed. I got some good days. Yeah, oh, there's a day that I missed. Yep. Yep. There's nope, oh, that's that's another one. Yep. Yeah, go back and do it again. I got two journals I gotta work on now. Here's the reality. The reality is it's not gonna be perfect. It never will be. You are never going to build all the disciplines and do all the thing in one day. That would not result in you denying yourself. It's easy to deny yourself one day. But to deny yourself when you wake up every single day and say, Lord, I'm gonna do my absolute best for you today. And I wanna to win today. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about the next day. You don't have to worry about, oh man, I missed two days in a row, and now I gotta get 10 days in a row. No, you don't, just get the next day. Just get the next day. This is a process. This is an opportunity for us to continue to grow closer and closer to the Lord If I told you that I was gonna cook dinner for you and I had this delicious slab of meat, delicious, premium, amazing, and I allowed you to pick how I could prepare that for you. I could prepare it in this, right here, or I could prepare it in this. We can't microwave our way through trying to be as holy as we possibly can to abide in God's word as quickly and as frequently as we can. It doesn't just happen in a microwave. If you want the best results, it takes time. It requires you to continue to commit yourself to it every single day. And there may not be results that you see every single day, but you have to believe that when Jesus says that those who listen to me, those who love others, those who remain in my words are my disciples, you must take that at face value, which requires us to continue to deny ourselves, which takes us back to the very beginning of this passage. Matthew chapter, 20, or Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. We're gonna end right here because we started right here. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, 
Take up your cross and follow me. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to read the next two verses because the two verses, the next two verses are incredibly powerful. Jesus then says this, there's an implication that if you don't do verses 20, if you don't do verse 24, there's an implication, there's a danger. Jesus says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. We talk about a lot of different promises in scripture. We talk about a lot of different things where we see like, oh man, God will never leave me. God will never forsake me. Those are the kinds of things that we as believers, we wanna grasp onto, right? <clears throat> those are the things that we love. Yes, I want more of those things. Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you don't deny yourself, you're gonna lose your life. He says, but if you give up your life for my sake, if you deny yourself, if you abide in my words, if you love other people, it will lead you to being a person that bears fruit. Fruit doesn't grow overnight. It, takes, it is a process. Meat does not taste good coming out of a microwave. It tastes best coming out of a slow-cooked smoker. That if you are willing to give up your life and do it God's way instead of your own way, Jesus provides another promise, you will save your life. In 26, he says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? I love that question that Jesus leaves us with. Is anything worth more than your soul? And it's the question that I would ask you tonight. Is anything worth more than your soul? If we were to answer that objectively, we would say, of course not, nothing's more important than my soul. But if we looked at it subject, subjectively, we might say, well, there's certain things that are going on in my life that are maybe causing me to, you know, I just I kind of need to do it my way for a little bit. You know, I've been waiting on God and I've been praying to God and I've been waiting for him to show up and I feel like he hasn't, so I'm tired of waiting for his timing. I'd rather just embrace my timing. And there's different things that we experience that, while we might say and admit, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to lose my soul, but there's things that we look at. And if we were to actually look at ourselves in a mirror, we might say, I don't know that I recognize myself. I didn't think I'd be at this place. In fact, I don't even really know how I got here. Or maybe I do know how I got here. And I wish I could undo it. Jesus' promise is simple. If you're willing to give up your life, you'll save it. We give up our life to Christ by saying, Lord, I'd rather do it your way than my way. And if you're in here tonight and maybe you've been doing it God's way or your own way and not God's way for a little while, maybe that you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm, I'm disappointed in who I am. I don't know that I recognize the person that looks back at me in the mirror every morning. Maybe you've been looking on the wrong side of that mirror and you've thought, you know, I'm just gonna keep that Bible at just a little bit of a distance and there's things that I don't like and there's things that I know that I must come to grips with. There's things that I know that I must look at square in the eyes and say, Lord, I know I need to obey you with this and I haven't wanted to because for whatever reason. But maybe nights, tonight's the night where you get a really close look and that starts with us by saying, God, I'm sorry. I want to do it your way. I don't want to do it my way. I'm willing to give up my own way for your way. And for some of you, you've never given up your own way. You've never said yes to Jesus. You've been close. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you still have questions, but you feel this stirring. You feel, man, there's something in there. And I feel like the Lord's doing something. You're not going to have all the answers tonight. By the way, you will never live an entire lifetime of having all the answers ever. That's how truly magnificent God is because every single day that we live committed to him, it's a step of faith. Why? Because we deny ourselves. We don't want to do it our way. We'd rather do it his way. So for some of you, it's never been a yes to Christ. For others, maybe it's been a yes before, but now you're in a season and again, you don't recognize yourself. Maybe you're in here tonight and you've never been baptized by your own choice.
Jesus denied himself by choosing to go get baptized before he began his ministry. Why? Because that's what his father wanted. And he was willing to be obedient. And that call is upon our lives as well. Maybe your next step is, you know what, I've never been baptized by my own choice. I'm going to invite you to consider what that next step might look like. But if you're in here tonight or you're watching online, I'm going to lead a prayer. This prayer is an acknowledgement that we're willing to lay, lay aside our way of wanting to live, that we will choose to deny ourselves. We'll deny our own way and we'll do it God's way. And it's the acknowledgement that we're in need of a savior. And we live in a world that will try to sell at every turn something that will try to save you, but nothing will save you except the blood of Jesus because he hung on a cross and he paid for your life. He paid for my life. He paid for the sins of humanity and he wishes that every single person would come to know him through repentance. By the way, if you're watching online, and you pray this prayer that I'm about to lead out, I'm gonna invite you to text the word amen to 77247. Don't let anything stop you from texting that. Let us know that you do that. Pray this prayer with me and then text amen to 77247. We wanna encourage you, we wanna walk with you.